Hi, this is Harold in China. Today I want to talk about uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping's first trip outside of China since COVID started. Um, Xi Jinping yesterday arrived in Uzbekistan where there's a meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. That's an organization you may not have heard about because it's not been reported much in the media even though it's been founded 21 years ago in Shanghai, hence the name. And um, it's a distinctly Asian organization with uh, most Central Asian countries and China obviously and Russia being members, but also India. So it's like a pan-Asian almost, except for some countries in Western Asia. And um, that makes it very relevant in terms of number of people who live in countries that are SCO members, but also economically think about India, China, Russia. These are countries with vast resources, with high technology, with high manufacturing capabilities, huge numbers of, of labor availability, low cost labor also in, I think, uh, India, Pakistan and um, resources obviously in Russia, but also in, in Central Asia, there's a lot of rare earth uh, available in that area. So it's, it's a very relevant organization, but unlike maybe some, some established organizations like, uh, like the United Nations or the WTO, <coughs> the SEO is still forming itself. So it's not yet very strong in terms of uh, mechanisms in terms of enforcement of of uh, decisions that they make it's more of a collaborative forum for discussion how these countries work together and that's the Chinese way they don't want to uh, set up organizations that um, make rules and then enforce them against the will of individual countries like uh, the EU for example going against Poland going against Hungary the SEO will not become such an organization. Um, however, the SEO is intended to, for example, mediate in border disputes. Um, there's a lot of border disputes in that region still. It's less uh, maybe stable and established as Western Europe. Um, and, um, but also economic cooperation is increasingly part of the SEO. And in the current time, I think it's very relevant to be aware um, how important this meeting is, uh, first of all, for, for Russian President Putin, who is hated in the West. The West keeps saying he's isolated. That's definitely not the case. <laughs> he's been warmly welcomed at the SCO meeting. Uh, other Russian high officials, like the, the foreign minister of Russia, has been very warmly welcomed in Africa before. So, no, he's not isolated, he's just not welcome in the West. Um, the SEO is also very relevant because India and China have had a lot of tensions in the recent years. There has been a border dispute in a region that most people don't know about, probably it's a region in Kashmir. Kashmir is claimed by India and by Pakistan and parts of the very eastern part of Kashmir is claimed by China and uh, de facto controlled by China, whereas Pakistan and India each control about half of Kashmir region. And there's always tension, not just between India and China, but also between Pakistan and India. Pakistan and China, they have a very strong and, and stable relationship. So, so there's no tensions to my knowledge between Pakistan and China at the Kashmir region, but India has tensions with both neighbors in that region. And it's gone so far that there have been clashes, like the two countries have made the promise that they will not shoot at each other. There has been an Indian-Chinese war very long time ago. I don't even know what it was, the 60s, it was a very, very long time ago. And after that, the countries decided they will not shoot again, they will accept the current line of actual control. And, but recently, both sides accuse each other that the other one crossed this line of actual control. And although they didn't shoot, they kept the promise to not shoot. They um, ended up in fistfights, uh, throwing rocks, using batons, beating each other. And several people died on both sides. So 
So it has been very tense. Uh, it, it seems India has been playing up a bit this, this fight where people have died. They've claimed to have more than 10 soldiers dead. Um, some assume that it could be because India has this electoral democracy to decide the government, so to, to distract from internal conflicts in India. The Indian President Modi may like to play up this external enemy narrative so that Indians will vote for the strong leader. China, on the other hand, has always played it down very much. They claim to only have lost only. I mean, they have lost three people in that fight. Young men who died, they were honored as martyrs. Um, uh, but other than that, the, this, this honoring them as martyrs has happened like one year after the clash happened. So it shows how China has always tried to downplay the emotions as they don't want public emotions to interfere with the liberty of the of the national government to to deal in in international politics so and china has really no interest to antagonize india like from a geopolitical perspective it's very important for china that india keeps a neutral position between the us and china or ideally joins the chinese side with the belt and road um, with, with the SEO, with uh, other organizations that China is building to establish an independent Asia. And it seems in recent uh, months, India has increasingly stepped away from the US. The very big uh, move by India was obviously in spring when Russia escalated the ongoing war in Ukraine in February. India refused to condemn Russia. India refused uh, to sanction Russia. India has always refused to sanction Iran. India has always kept a, a, a good relationship with Iran as well. So India has not been the staunch American ally that it's been portrayed by Western media sometimes, like the biggest democracy, so naturally they're on the side of the US. That's definitely not true. And. Um, so now in recent months, maybe also because of the tension between uh, Russia and the West, where India refused to join the West in condemning Russia, India has increasingly uh, made moves to get closer to its Asian neighbors. and. Um, so Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, arrived yesterday in Uzbekistan and he instantly met, like in the first day he met like seven, eight uh, other presidents, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Mongolia, Belarus, um, Azerbaijan and uh, the Russian president Vladimir Putin. He has not yet met the Indian president Modi. We'll see if that happens today on Friday. Maybe once the video is out, that's already happened. But it shows the first trip abroad by Xi Jinping was highly efficient. So he didn't just go to see someone. He, he went to see like the whole range, basically all the Western neighbors of China, um, plus some countries that are further away, like Belarus and Azerbaijan. And um, this... Uh, fact that his first trip abroad in about two years is it two years yeah about almost two years since the beginning of or since the end of 2019 the first trip abroad was not to the us it was not to europe that to me really strongly signifies the shift in geopolitics 10 years ago China would still have seen the US-China relationship as by far the most relevant relationship for Chinese foreign policy and for Chinese economy as well. Now, uh, Xi Jinping realizes he's not welcome in the West. No matter what he does, no matter what China does, the West will not respect China as long as China keeps growing, as long as China keeps uh, its economic momentum because the West doesn't want an economic power that's bigger than the West and uh, China having more people about double the number of people of Europe and the US combined 
not double, but a, a lot more. So the US has about 350 million, the EU has more than 500 million, and China has about 1.4 billion. So yeah, China, if they just achieve like 60, 70% of per capita GDP, they're not just bigger than the US, they're bigger than the EU and the US combined. So that's where China is going. And the West does not want to accept that. The West wants to keep an economic and political dominance over the world, over the global system. And so I guess Xi Jinping just told himself, well, I'm not going to convince the West to accept China as, as, as a modern country. So I'm going to talk to people that are relevant for the stability of Asia which is China's neighborhood, China's environment, and which has faced repeated attacks that one has to suspect were at least tolerated, if not actively supported by the US, namely uh, a, a attempted overthrow of the Kazakh uh, government by Islamic forces, Islamist forces that came out of uh, Afghanistan after the Taliban took back power those extremists went through the Central Asian nations like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan all the way north to Kazakhstan and were welcomed by <laughs> Russian military support so the Russians instantly uh, stopped that attempt at a violent overthrow but it shows the risk these countries in Central Asia they're all modern Muslim countries. They all have this slight threat that uh, Islamic terrorism spreads, as it has done in Afghanistan, as also Pakistan always, uh, like, always is threatened by and, and experiences Islamic violence. And um, these uh, like, uh, moderate Islamic countries in Central Asia they are all very, very positive on China regarding the Xinjiang policy where they claim or they confirm that uh, Islam is not threatened in Xinjiang. It's the extremism that's threatened and has been wiped out. And that's exactly what they want for themselves. They want the people to be able to live their uh, Islamic faith, their Islamic beliefs, but they don't want this Salafist Saudi um, extremism invade their religious communities and threaten the stability of their countries and um, so yeah Xi Jinping I think it's a big step it's a big show of confidence of China to say you know what I'm not even going to care about the West it's time to build up the fair world order with, pe with people with countries who are willing to cooperate and including India which we have tensions with but at least they don't make it a fundamental tension that they attack us and want to change the way how we live. We have disputes that we can negotiate about, but with India at least we can talk and we can make promises and they keep their promises. It's been a very interesting comment in the Global Times, which is a Communist Party newspaper, so it's not uh, like uh, independent media or anything it's it's an official uh, outlet of the CPC and um, they explicitly write Western countries with their instable governments and and weak leadership are unable to keep promises and I mean <laughs> it's true it's true Iran has seen it the Kurds in Syria have seen it so Iran the, the nuclear deal that the US unilaterally just cancelled without any legal basis why they should cancel it. Iran was adhering to the deal. The US under Trump just said, I don't like it. They went out. The Kurds in, in Syria, which were fighting alongside with the US against uh, IS, the Islamic State, um, when it wasn't convenient for the US, when they wanted to please Turkey, they just fell in, in the Kurds back and let them drop and said, yeah, Turkey, go ahead, attack them. So, yeah, the US doesn't keep promises. And same, of course, with Taiwan. I'm not even going to go in there this video, already at 15 minutes. 
Um, but yeah, with Taiwan, the US promised to not have high level diplomatic ties with Taiwan. Um, when they recognized Beijing as the official government of China, including Taiwan. Uh, and now they're sending or they're allowing in their own terms, <laughs> allowing uh, their highest, their third highest person in command, uh, Nancy Pelosi, to go there and visit. So that's definitely high level diplomatic visits. So yeah, the US cannot be trusted. And I think if I took some time to make a list, there's way more examples of when the US has broken promises and contracts or not adhered to international norms and standards. Um, many they don't even sign, like many uh, United Nations norms and agreements they don't even ratify so, so that they wouldn't be bound by them. So yeah, the Chinese are now very clear that the West cannot be trusted. And for Europe this means Europe has to make a choice. Do we really think we can stay prosperous without the resources of Asia, without the uh, low-cost labor of Asia, without the big market of Asia, and solely rely on the US? And do we really think the US has the best intentions for Europe? Or do we finally emancipate ourselves and say, all right, Europe has to stop listening to that failing empire in the US. Well, my choice is clear. I've moved to China a long time ago to support the emergence of a socialist country. Um, but I think I don't hope for Europe to fall. I really don't. I really wish Europe can stay prosperous. And I really think a lot of Chinese think the same way. They love to see a prosperous Europe that they can learn from and look up to. If only Europe could also learn from China and look up to China in some respects, that would be a more respectful relationship. But it's not in China's interest to see, to see Europe weak and poor, really not. Because be it as a trading partner to import top quality goods from Europe, or be it as a market to sell high priced, high quality goods to Europe, China can only profit from a strong Europe and Europe needs to be aware of this. Because I don't think the US has the intention to see Europe strong and powerful. There has been, I, I haven't seen the original RAND uh, Corporation uh, article, but recently there's been talks about a leaked article that explicitly states that sanctioning Russian oil and gas would destroy the German economy and make Germany poor. And that was shortly before the escalation in Ukraine happened and the US pushed Europe to sanction oil and gas uh, from Russia, which now is dramatically damaging the European industry. And we'll see what happens this winter. With that, <laughs> thank you for watching. Please share and like. Bye-bye.